And the fact with these financial products is, is that they're, they're financial products. They're not investments. Okay, there's, there's a difference between an investment and a retail financial product. So when I started studying wealthy people, I realized they don't, they don't touch mutual funds. They don't do the 401k. They don't use IRAs. Uh, they might own those companies that sell those things right. to other people, but they don't do them themselves. And that was a yeah. big difference that I took on. You know, it's not about that. It's about cash flow. I need to look yeah. at how can I build passive income that exceeds my expenses, savings, and taxes. This is Better Well with Caleb Williams. Jerry, my man, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Caleb. It's good to be on. It is good to have you here. Um, I, we were talking before just about, you know, our backgrounds, and it was, it's been cool to connect with you because we have, similar, we have similar backgrounds as it relates to, like, even what we're doing. And so what I would love is for you to give a little bit of context of your, like, origin story because I think we can, we can learn a lot from where someone's come up. And, and then also just like, let's jam about the end asset. Let's jam about mindset. Let's jam about um, how you think about money and, and what things you're doing with money. And I'm hoping that at the end of this conversation that people have some real key takeaways as it relates to how they can better their life as it relates to the wealth. Totally. Yeah. I'd love to do that. So let's, let's jump into your origin story, man. And like, I would love to hear uh, just, just you know, who you are, where you came from, and like some of the context that you grew up in. Yeah, I mean, so, so as far as like being um, in the industries, I, I'm a, uh, a business owner, I own a company now called Wealth Dynamics. So we help people, you know, become financially educated, wealthy and navigate their economic futures with certainty. Um, and really with the focus of them helping build, you know, more strong communities around them with what they've learned. But um, being in the industry, I started as a traditional financial advisor. So I was uh, you know, mutual funds, 401ks, stocks, bonds, term insurance. Um, and, and I started with a very large agency and it was kind of almost like, uh, it was, it was not something I was passionate about as a kid. I wasn't like, I'm going to grow up and be a financial advisor. Right. So, you know, in high school, I was really into fitness and bodybuilding. Um, I was an amateur bodybuilder for a number of years. My dream was to be a personal trainer and own a gym. Right. And, and this more speaks to like entrepreneurism, right? So I, I, I literally graduated high school, Caleb. I walked off stage with my diploma and then I went and trained my first client. Like it was just like that, right? And, and after about six months, I got promoted up in the gym. And I was, at this time I was 18 years old. I got promoted up to like the head personal trainer, like the highest position I could reach in the first six months. Um, and I had the realization of like, wow, somebody has to die or quit for me to go any further and uh, at the time, like I, I was, I was getting into sales too. I didn't know head personal trainer really just meant salesperson. I had to yeah. close people on personal training packages. So I closed this giant deal one day and it was the biggest training package we had is like four grand. And uh, I was feeling good. About it. I was like, man, that's awesome. I wonder what I'm going to make on this. And I think I made $30. And I remember just yeah. feeling like the wind got let out of my sails. Right. And I had a buddy at the time that was in financial services uh, with a larger company. He's like, Hey, check out, check out what I'm doing. I think you would enjoy it. And I remember sitting down and taking a look at it and I've never been into like math and, and money. And like, it just wasn't a thing as a kid that I was interested in because I didn't grow up with it. And uh, I remember seeing the help aspect. It was the same reason I got into personal training. Financially, I saw people are in the same condition as the average person is in physically and they need help. And if they don't get help, like it's not going to be good for them in the future. And that part of me was like, like, I can't know this and not do something. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating, man. Just about the growing up in the gym, being a, a glorified salesperson yeah. and, and just kind of being like, man, like I, 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 I've heard many, many stories as people, people have a lot of those same experiences. And so the aha moment that you had, did you have any aha moments other than being like, there's got to be a better way? You know, as a kid, um, I think at the age of 17, I remember making the conscious decision that I was going to quit on money. Yeah. Like, so my, my parents had, had gotten uh, divorced from each other, I think three different times, married, divorced, married, divorced, you know, not to different people, but just back to themselves and then divorced again. And, you know, so as a little kid, like I, I watched our house, we lost the house when I was eight, uh, same summer, my mom's car got repoed. Um, 
you know, but, and, and I heard money fights over and over and over shouting and all this stuff growing up. So money was not something I viewed as a tool. It's something I viewed as like a, a, a source of my problems, yeah. right? Like if it wasn't for money, my parents might still be together. And, and I didn't know anyone wealthy. So it wasn't like a, it wasn't even like, like a real thing. I didn't have a real life example of somebody that was doing well with money. I couldn't look at that. It was for me, I, an idea that you had to be a TV star and it was only in the movies. So at some point, I forget when or, and who, but they, they told me that money wasn't backed by anything. And I was probably 17 years old and I've always been rebellious. And when I was like, are you freaking serious? Like I'm working a job thinking about going to college to earn this thing and it's monopoly paper. Yeah. And, and I was driving up in my car. I remember driving up this hill called Knick and, and I remember thinking like, all right, I'm just not going to do it. Like I'm not going to play the game. I'm not interested in it. If it's not backed by anything, I'd rather just be happy and, and live my life. And I remember making that decision and I didn't know the, I didn't know anything about economics and, and about Austrian economics and Keynesian economics and, you know, the dollar being backed by gold. I didn't know any of that. I just knew like, this is fake and I'm trading my life for it. Yeah. And I, I chose poverty. I was like, all right, well then I'm just going to not do anything and not participate. And, you know, fast forward two years when I was married, uh, first got married to my wife, Lexi, in our first, first six months, we ended up homeless. And that's wow. where, that's where poverty led to is I was, you know, squatting with my wife in an abandoned house. And that was the realization at, that I had. And this was after the gym was whether I want to participate or not, this money thing is there and it's going to drag me along kicking and screaming, whether I do something about it or not. And I can either be cause or I can be effect. And mm -hmm. that was my turning point on, okay, I actually have to start taking some responsibility here, whether I, I like the game or not. Man, mindset is everything. And it's so interesting because you grew up with the idea of like money being the reason why everything didn't work out. And the and, and fact is, you and I both know this, that it's, it's just a, a tool. And yeah. it's sort of like tool with a mirror and whatever, yeah. you know, it just really it reflects on where you're at. And so that's great. After the gym, you started working at a traditional or typical financial planning. Like, what did you, what did you learn from that? And then I want to like, and then did you leave that to start Wealth Dynamics? So, so there's kind of happened in phases, right? So, so that was a, um, a very, very large company. Um, and, and basically I, I learned there a lot of the basics. They were very big on term insurance, no whole life. Like I was taught whole life is the devil, right? Yeah. So like from day one, that was the reason why this company existed was whole life is the devil. Yep. So just, just have that in your back of your mind. Anyone that's listening, I know exactly that's like who you're talking on. about. They, the companies will be re renamed nameless, but I know who they you're will, talking yeah. about. Yeah. We don't want to incite any guilt on anybody, but, um, so I learned that from day one. And so I, I, I learned about, you know, paying off debt and budgeting and a lot of like good basic stuff, um, which was what I personally needed at that time. Cause I wasn't doing any of that stuff. I was, you know, going around advising people. This just speaks to the industry, right? I was going around advising people. My finances were a mess. Like they were not on track. So I learned some fundamentals that organization, um, was, I didn't like the model it was a little too recruiting focused. Um, to me, there's no product there. There's not, nothing happens if I recruit a warm body, right? Like there's a lot of training and hatting and, and systems. So um, you know, I ended up leaving and starting my own firm. I went independent and I was only probably 20, maybe 21 years old, um, going independent in this giant industry. And granted, like I had my series six and my 63, I was, I was, you know, life and health licensed. And, uh, when I went independent, I ended up striking up a relationship with Dave Ramsey. Oh, so wow. we, we, we go further down the alley of anti whole life insurance <laughs> And I became an endorsed local provider for Dave Ramsey for investing. Um, and I did that for a number of years. I was in, I think, eight different states. And uh, my business, you know, really grew. And it was a great, you know, it was a great partnership as far as like having a, a brand and credibility and a model to follow. Um, but again, like, like I would meet with people, right? And it was very like focused on let's build up the retirement nest egg. When you're 60, 65, whenever you can live off of it. And as long as you don't pull out too much money and you die on time, then nothing bad will happen. And, and I remember setting up, you know, the 12%, the growth stock mutual funds and, uh, you know, building that out for people and still seeing like, all right, well, these, these guys are still terrified every two weeks because of their paycheck and they still don't have money and they're still not wealthy. And in the middle of this, Caleb, so I, at, at 22, my mom died at 60. I'm so I was sorry. her financial advisor. 
And, and that just shook me because I was like her, I was her advisor. That's the age you're supposed to retire. So I'm, I'm building her retirement plan. I'm saying, mom, 60 is the year. That's when it happens. And she gets diagnosed with colon cancer. Six months later, she's gone. And, and that was just like, you know, my entire viewpoint on like everything I was telling people to do just unraveled in front of me with my own mom. And, and so I'm like standing back, like, okay, like how, how does this, how does this work? How do I compute this? Because this is my profession and this is what the message is. I just watched it not work. And, and it wasn't even on a small scale. It was a very large scale. So that was like a, a moment that impacted me and immediately it, 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 it kind of hit me and it put that little seed in the back of my head of like, all right, I need to actively be seeing if there's another way for this to be done because I don't want that to happen again. And, and that was kind of like my big turning point. And so, you know, I, I kept my business going for several years and, and I learned some key information about, um, you know, the federal reserve and, and some of the stuff that happens higher level, um, you know, a few years later. And that was really when I, you know, started my company now, um, and at that time, like I, I literally gave my business away. I was like, guys, I can't do this anymore. I just learned all like, so I read a book called the creature from Jekyll Island. Yep. Oh, I was mess with your like brain. Yep. Three days after that, I was like, so life as I know it is a scam. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's kind of what I got from that book. And then I, I watched a video series called the hidden secrets of money um, by a gentleman named Mike Maloney. And that just further drilled it in. And then on top of that, Within that same two week period, the movie, the big short comes out yep, and I wow. watch the big short and I get done with the big short and I have the realization I'm freaking, uh, what is his name? Ryan Reynolds or whatever the, the broker, I was the scumbag. I'm the guy pitching the deal to anybody with no skin in the game. And at the end of the movie, basically everyone lost money, but him. So I, I basically, at that point, I gave my business away to a colleague. I was like, Hey, I can't do this anymore. This is not what I'm about. Um, you know, and I restarted from zero and, and built Wealth Dynamics. How old were you when you just, just like, I can't be a part of this and started Wealth Dynamics? That was in um, 2016. So I would have been 24 years old. Wow. Wow. Now, talk to me about Dave Ramsey. Talk to me about that philosophy. Talk to me about like now looking back, what were some of the things that you were like speaking into people's lives and teaching that you're like, I'm going to. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I take back what I said because I think it's super, super interesting that you probably I'm making an assumption that you disagree a lot of what Dave Ramsey teaches now. And it's just ironic. Yeah. And I, and I think there's a degree of what Dave teaches that is very basic, right? And, and it's totally fitting. He calls it the baby steps. Those are the baby steps. If I'm a baby financially, those are some steps I can take that will help me. Um, now, in real life, I can't keep taking baby steps. At some point I become a big boy and then an adult, and then I've got to go get a job and, and life moves fast. I can't keep doing baby steps. So, you know, there's definitely, there's something to be said for budgeting. There's something to be said for paying off debt. Um, where I fundamentally disagree with Dave and it's something when I learned this information, I really, and I still don't know the answer. I really had to wonder, does Dave know this? And he's just not telling people or he's totally oblivious. And, and it's the idea that he has this phrase and it's um, debt is dumb, cash is king, right? Cash is debt. Yeah. Federal Reserve note, it is literally debt. There's nothing behind it. It's debt. It's borrowed into existence. And so that was the part where everything built off of that was where I veered off on a different path on cash is not king. Cash is also debt. So I shouldn't say debt is dumb, but then go tell people to accumulate little green pieces of debt. Yeah. And, right. and so, the reality is you put your money in a bank. Do you actually think that's like straight up cash that they're sitting on? Yeah. yeah. No. So, so, so that was the big, crazy. that was the big thing. And, and then the other part is the mutual funds, right? Um, he talks about the 12% growth stock mutual funds. I know exactly what fund he's talking about. It's called growth fund of America. It's with American funds. I used to sell it all day long. And, and the big difference is there. That's, that's before fees. Okay, that's also average annual return, which is different than compounding annual growth rate. And, and the fact with these financial products is, is that they're, they're financial products. They're not investments. Okay, there's, there's a difference between an investment and a retail financial product. And so Dave really has like blended in like financial consumerism with investing. Those are two totally different things. And so when I started studying wealthy people, I realized they don't, they don't touch mutual funds. They don't do the 401k. They don't use IRAs. 
uh, they might own those companies that sell those things right. to other people, but they don't do them themselves. And that was a yeah. big difference that I took on. You know, it's not about that. It's about cash flow. I need to look yeah. at how can I build passive income that exceeds my expenses, savings, and taxes. Yeah, I had uh, Barry Dykes on on my show, and he has a chapter in one of his books that it's like you'll never meet a millionaire that made their millions off of mutual funds. It's either yeah. someone that already has money diversifying, but the people that really know what's going on aren't going to diversify in a no. in a Dave Ramsey approved growth mutual fund. So it's interesting when I when I explain Dave Ramsey to other people, I just say Dave's Dave's an incredible communicator and knows who's who he's talking to. The the sad yeah. reality is majority of people you and I aren't directly going to be able to help because there's so many things that are wrong that's like yeah you could have the right philosophy but you have no money and you're like in right. crazy debt and so I, I have a ton of respect for Dave and what he teaches I just it's like you have to understand who he's teaching to and I've I far too many people are taking his his logic or lack of logic and trying to build wealth on it whereas I'm not, I really do believe that he, he's clear with his message and that's creating the most good. And we just have to like have the maturity to be like, listen, there's multiple different messages because Dave, uh, Robert Kiyosaki could be damaging to someone who's like, has the mindset leverages credit cards to do something that doesn't work out. You can see yeah. where, you can see where Dave's, Dave's message lands with a lot of people. Totally. And what really helped me, um, I learned this when I went independent because I was, you know, working with, with Dave. Dave got his start at the same company I got my start at. Mm, really? So when I had the connection of those origin stories, I was like, okay, cool. I totally know. I get it now. Like that's, that's what it's always going to be. Um, so, you know, like you said, it's data. At the end of the day, we have to be able to look at all the data, assimilate where we're at, where we're trying to be at and which data helps us get there. Um, and I, th I think, you know, Dave is a good way to get somebody that's not into the middle class securely into the middle class. I don't think it gets you past that. What was the turning point when it comes to life insurance and whole life? And I want you to answer that. And then I want to go back and say, someone sits down with you and says, dude, I want you, you're, you to mentor me and, and I want to become wealthy. Um, so I, I want to first get your thoughts on like that conversion. And then the second thing is I, I want to like jam with you as it relates to how one can create wealth and what you would, what you would say. Yeah. So with the life insurance, that was interesting for me when I, so when I gave my business away, um, I didn't have a product. I had, I had no product. I didn't know what I was going to help people with. I just knew the, I, I just knew what was wrong. I knew that there's a system out there that people don't know about and it's evil and I'm passionate about that and I need to fix that somehow. And so I started with investments, right? So I, I became a, a private placement broker. And so I started working with people in private real estate deals and helping them invest there instead and that was great. Like I, I could put somebody into a position where they could be much more successful with their investments, but I started realizing, okay, well now I'm only helping the people that have money. Yeah. So what if somebody doesn't have money? And then I had to go back to, well, where would they put it? And, and I knew they couldn't do the bank because I just learned all about that. So it's like, it can't be the bank. And I knew they couldn't do IRAs and 401ks because that's going to end up in the stock market. So I was like, you know, gold, that, that was the only thing I knew at that time was let's put it in gold and that's good. And so we started with that. And then I started like doing some research on like, well, where else do wealthy people put their money? Where have they put their money? And life insurance kept coming up and I wrote it off. I was like, it, it's not life insurance. I promise you it's not life insurance. It can't be life insurance. And I would just ignore it. And somehow I came across an illustration of a highly cash value life insurance policy online. And I pulled it up and it was like seeing a unicorn. Yeah. Like it, in my, yep. in my mind, it didn't exist. I was taught the cash value is zero for the first two to three years. There's no growth. You lose it all. You die when you lose it all. And, and, and basically just this big, you know, evil cash value. And I saw, well, this guy has like 80% of his money the first year. It looks like he can borrow all of that right away. And if I'm seeing this right, when he borrows it, he's still earning dividends. That makes a lot of sense. Yep. And so I, I spent, this was, was, this was Christmas weekend. Uh, I spent entire Christmas weekend, 36 hours just studying whole life insurance. That was what wow. I did for my Christmas weekend. And I got to the point where I understood it and I understood what, because the stuff Dave says isn't wrong. There are poorly designed policies that are exactly that way. Yep. But what he doesn't say is that that's up to the agent. The agent can choose to do hirely cash value and funnel money into paid up additions and get paid significantly less commission. Or the agent can choose to do high base premium, 
not even tell the client that they could do high early cash value and make freaking five, five figures on every deal he closes. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was what I learned about there. And so that was when I started plugging in, okay, this is where we will accumulate money. We will store money here. When we have enough money here, we'll borrow against that and do these investment deals. Yep. Okay. So it was very much like the private placement was one of those things that came first and you're like, okay, what's a more efficient way to do that? That's where you stumbled upon life insurance and you're like, life insurance is terrible, which by the way, Dave's a, a correct again. If not set up properly, it's trash. And when it's set up properly, it's, it's one of the most powerful foundational assets that you can have in your life. Um, and what's interesting is, again, if you put yourselves in Dave's shoes, he's like, it, he's in a tough position, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, it's, it's hard because you know, we know of a lot of people that are doing things that you and I would not endorse. And so um, that's super fascinating. I would love to have someone on the show talk about how gold and real estate go together because I think um, it would be, it would be interesting to hear, hear that. Um, and I know that people have a lot of good insights on that. Um, all right. Let's say I sit down with you and say, Jerry, I want to become wealthy. I'm making good money. I, I want to be able to make an impact in the world. And I know that the current system is, is not the right fit. Help me. Mm. Where, where would you begin? Like, what does your process look like in, in the, how you teach someone in the mindset? Yeah. So I have a, a process I built and it's called the blueprint of financial freedom. It's, it's a phased program of, of getting somebody from where they're at today, all the way up to, you know, one of the big milestones is becoming an accredited investor. Um, for those that don't know what that means, that's, uh, you know, basic, you know, a million dollar net worth, excluding your primary residence. Um, when you become an accredited investor, and this was something that blew my mind when I learned, um, there literally are investment opportunities that are illegal for you to be advertised to about prior to being an accredited investor. So it's not even, you're not allowed to know, like as a broker, I would get fined and, and maybe even put in jail if I told you about them prior to you being accredited. Um, we're talking better tax benefits, better returns, better, better overall assets. So a big goal is get there because if we can get there, the curtain gets pulled back, all of that becomes available. So I educate people on that. And then I also look at once you're there, the goal there is to have passive income that exceeds my expenses, my savings, which is going to be 40% of my gross and my, my uh, uh, taxes that I owe. And if I have that, I'm financially free and I always will be. That's kind of the end game, right? Mm -hmm. And then it really is a process of reverse engineering backwards from there. And that's what our blueprint is all about. And so I'll sit down and, um, you know, one of the first things I look at is we need to start you on a forced savings plan. Yeah. Um, and that's where we use the, the life insurance. We call it the sacred account. But basically, the, the, the forced savings plan, I relate this to when I was a kid. I used to, my sister has a ranch. So we used to go through and pull the sticks out of the fields and they would drive their truck up and down this 100, 100 acre ranch. And for fun, I used to tie a rope around my waist and tie the other end of it to the truck just to see how fast I could run. Because I knew like I had no choice but to run faster. I was going to get drugged. That's why we start with the sacred account first. It's, wow. it's called income necessity. You're going to get drugged if you don't keep up with this thing. And so it really, it kind of is a vacuum. It pulls the money into it every month. And that yeah. way you're left to literally spend what's left and you've paid yourself first. And then we focus on things like buying back your debt with your sacred account, um, you know, building up reserves, starting to invest, um, you know, getting into a home with a home, home equity line of credit rather than a mortgage. Um, and it's really this layer of steps that we've built congruently that gets somebody accredited. And the result is last year we, we produced eight accredited investors. Um, which is just stupid, like ridiculous. That's, that's literally, we made eight millionaires last year that weren't millionaires prior to working with us. Wow. Um, and they're not 60. It wasn't a 20 or 30 year game. This happened in a, in a three to five year period. I love that. Um, why 40% savings? Like, how do you get to that number? So when you study the top 1%, um, since 1913, there's actually a chart. Um, they've saved 40% of their gross income consistently. And you can actually see that. And what happens is they save and you can see during different economic periods, like the Great Depression, they, they drop their savings rate. They actually go into debt during the Great Depression. So they're basically stacking up when the economy is good. And then when the economy crashes, they go in and buy everything. And then they go right back up to 40 again. And they continue that trend during yep. every single recession that's ever happened. Yeah, I, I heard it once said that if, if a good way to build wealth is to save, take very little risk, and then take 10 risks throughout your life that have like massive upside. And you're going to way outperform uh, just the, the Dave Ramsey, 
dollar cost average approach. And it's, it's an interesting approach. I'm not saying I endorse it. I'm just saying it's a, it's a, it's an example of why the wealthier do get wealthy uh, mm-hmm. is they, they buy when everyone's panicking. Um, let's, let's talk about debt. You, you intrigued me. Do you, do you recommend people pay off all their debt or do you have a combination of like good debt versus bad debt? How do you, how do you, uh, talk about debt with people? And I noticed that you talked about the difference between a home equity and a mortgage. Wondering if you can unpack that as well. Yeah. So debt, I like to really, I like simplifying things, right? So there's this idea of good debt, bad debt. I remember the first time I heard that my, my boss at the gym was explaining to me why her college loans were good debt. Uh, which was funny because I didn't even ask about them. She's just justifying randomly like, yeah, I got my college loans. It's good debt. There's no such thing as good debt and bad, he- the bad debt. There's debt. And then there's good behavior and bad behavior, right? Same with money. There's no such thing as good money and bad money. There's just money. And then you have good behavior or bad behavior. Um, so with debt, if debt does not pay me, I should not have it, right? So meaning it has to have cash flow that exceeds what it costs, um, the idea of debt and most people don't realize this, but I, you know, I've been in the industry long enough to know the minds of the institutions that we're working and are up against in this industry. When we're trying to help people, people are very caught up on interest. When you study the idea of interest, interest is a mathematical factor used to prolong the period that a person pays their income to the institution. So somebody is very worried about, I'm paying too high of interest may be true. Yeah, you're paying interest, but the bank is not trying to make interest. They're trying to get your money on a fixed monthly basis for the longest period of time possible. And when you realize that you realize, okay, having debt like that, like a car loan or or a student loan or credit cards, like that's, that's actually me being taken advantage of by the system. And they're taking away my 40%. Most people could save 40% if it weren't for them having to pay 40 to 60% to institutions and wall street and the IRS. Right. So that's kind of the idea behind it. So what I tell people to do is we're going to buy your debt back with your cash value because debt, debt is an asset on their balance sheet, but a liability on mine. So when I'm talking about debt, I'm actually having the discussion of acquiring an asset. It's a cash flowing interest accruing asset. So I'm going to basically use my cash value to borrow against and pay the debts off, buy them back. And then whatever I used to pay on them, I'm going to now pay to myself on my cash value. And now I can actually be keeping all of that money and keeping all that interest and using my bank instead of theirs. So that's, that's kind of the concept of it. Do you recommend people pay their mortgage off with their life insurance? No. So that's where we use the HELOC. Um, The mortgage is a concept that was created in the Great Depression. Um, if you look, all of the terrible financial products out there happened during a depression or a recession. Uh, and I have a feeling we're about to have another one happen this year, next year with, with, uh, uh, federal cryptocurrency, but that's a whole different conversation. Um, but basically with the mortgage, I recommend people use a home equity line of credit instead of a mortgage. And the idea behind that is, is I can deposit into it just instead of putting my paycheck in the bank, I can actually deposit my paycheck into my credit line, reduce my principal, save interest, and then borrow the money out to cash flow, pay bills, invest. Um, and by doing so, I've had clients where we were in projections of their house mortgage producing them an extra $30 million net worth over the next 30 years of their lifespan in comparison to if they do the 30-year traditional, all they did was pay their house off. That's it. And, right. and they paid the bank twice the interest in, in that period. So you recommend people like buy their, their house with cash and then take out a home equity to like that. And then how much home equity loan can you get? If like, let, let's keep numbers simple. If you have a, your house is worth a yeah. hundred thousand, what kind of home equity can you get with that? And then how are you recommending your clients? Like you're saying, buy, buy a house with cash and then refinance into a home equity. Yeah. So here's what I like to do on that. So we, th- we talked about real estate and gold. I also, I also own a gold brokerage. So um, we save up a 20% down payment in gold. Okay. okay. You can do a line of credit against gold. So we borrow against the gold. We use that gold loan of uh, line of credit to then go purchase the house. You can buy a house on a HELOC with a 20% down payment, right? Now the down payment is going to get me into the HELOC. My HELOC mortgage payment is interest only. So my housing payment just dropped by like 300%. So the extra money I'm now going to pay my gold loan back, deleverage on my HELOC, on my gold gold line of credit. Once that's paid off, I then start depositing all of my paychecks into my home equity line of credit, and I'll just do all my bill pay and everything out of that account. It's literally yeah. a checking account. So that okay. reduces my interest significantly, 
And the goal is I want to get at least 50K built up in borrowable equity because I can then borrow that equity from the home line of credit, put that into a deal that cash flows, and then start building up wealth with my mortgage. Got it. Got it. And so you're, you're going 20% in and instead of getting a traditional 30-year mortgage, you're getting that 80% finance with the HELOC. Totally. Okay. So can I play devil's advocate for, for a second? Go for it. Go for it. So when I think of debt, I, I think of it's simply cost of capital. And I talk about what versus how. So I think mm-hmm. the problem that most people get themselves into is they buy things that they shouldn't, cars, houses, other things. And, yeah. all, and then they use, they use debt to acquire it. So that's like a car loan, like a, yeah. like a mortgage or whatever. Um, yeah. Where I, I, where I see debt is it's not necessarily in what you do. It's like, you have to figure out what you do. And that's a, that's a separate conversation. Like don't over leverage yourself, period. Get, get what, what you're going to do, but then make the most efficient decision. And I'm actually someone that's like, if, if it's all cost of capital, because at the end of the day, whether it's the insurance company's capital or whether it's the credit union's capital, we, we want our clients to be able to save more money. And so mm-hmm. for me, it all comes down to what, what would give you more control and more savings. So it's, it's interesting. I have equity built up in my life insurance plan and I also have a loan and that's, in my opinion, I have way more control and I could pay that off at any time, but I, I would rather have the control of, of capital over here and the cost of using the bank's capital is cheaper. And so it's just interesting. Like I, I actually really like how you explained it. I think it's, I think people that are listening to this are going to gain a lot from just our different viewpoints. Um, but mm-hmm. that's like the one difference that I think I have when it comes to um, controlling money. And, and I look at the cost of, of that money and it all comes down to being able to save more, which we both agree on. Yeah. And I, and I think the, the main thing to kind of point out some similarity is it sounds like you have enough where you could pay off your debt. Yes. So it's, it's different than I don't have the money. So I've got a, you're saying, yeah. no, no, I do have the money. I'm making the choice to use the bank instead. Um, and that's, that's better. Like that's better than I don't have money. So I need to go borrow theirs. Like it's, right. it's your, your cause rather than effect. Right. And that goes back to don't buy things that are not a good, like that's where really understand the difference between an asset and a liability. Because the problem is people buy a car that they don't have money for. And so they, they get into debt and then you look at it and you go this, the, how you purchased it is just another bad decision. that's compounded by the fact that you bought something that you can't afford. Exactly. To- totally spot on, man. Oh man, we I could talk all day long. What what other things are are have been like epiphanies for you as you've kind of been on this new, um, like this 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 new journey? And I know like when we reached out, we were we had a really great conversation. We're like, dude, we're we're like trying to do the same thing, and it's yeah. so cool to like unite with people that like get it. And I'm just excited to like rise the tide as it relates to education and get get people to see that there is a better way. Yeah, I think I think right now, like the main thing that that I'm really um, focusing on with people is like, especially we've had like COVID-19 and all this quarantine stuff, which hasn't been good. But if you watch debt pay down and savings rate, they're all time highs. So people are starting to have a wake up call on, okay, I actually need to start doing something with my finances. So what I'm trying to do is really catch that wave and say, okay, great, but let's turn this into a behavior. So that it's not just something we did when we were scared during COVID-19. It's something we should probably always do. Um, and so we're, we're teaching a lot about just understanding, like, what is money? Where did it come from? How do you produce more of it? Um, I have a concept I teach called the triangle of wealth, which is I've got to earn, save, and invest. Um, and if I don't do all three of those things, like, I can't, I can't build wealth. And especially today in the social media age, you'll see a lot of influencers who like to pick one of those things and it's usually earn or invest. They ignore the save part. Um, Cause we hear a lot of like savers are losers and cash is trash and all this stuff, which I get the viewpoint, but it's not helpful to people. So, you know, we've got to earn for sure. So how do we do that? You don't have to be a master salesperson. Like you basically have to, to be knowledgeable at something, be valuable and then go exchange with people and money will just show up. Yeah. And then you've got to save, which is keeping it off the top and paying yourself first. And you've got to invest in things that produce income, which then reinforce my ability to do number one, because now I have more income. Yeah. So that's really been a concept we're teaching is that this is a continuous triangle. And if you keep doing it, it keeps getting bigger. And that is wealth. And it's a behavior. It's not something that we have to stop after COVID gets done. You know, if you're paying off debt, if you're saving, like, great, let's keep it going. And that's that's been 
it's been cool to see and very interesting to see that this is what it took to get people to do that. I, man, I love it. And I'm hundred percent in agree and saving has a bad rap and it's the discipline. It's like, I, I had a conversation with someone uh, before, before you, and we were talking about like yield and time. And that's like really, really important. But I just pointed out, dude, you could have an amazing yield and, and have 30, 40 years. But if you don't put anything in that machine, it's zero. zero. Yeah. And so I think the, uh, we have, we have stats on our end that 97% of people are like way under saving. They're not financially mm-hmm. imbalanced. And so it's like, it doesn't matter what you and I are saying, the strategies that we have, we, we could, no pun intended, have gold on our hands and you're still going to miss out because you, you haven't put yourself in a position to actually play the game. Um, so man, I a hundred percent love this. How can people like connect with you and like, how can they like learn more about what you're, what you're up to? I know that you had a book. I know that you have your main website and there's just a lot of areas that a lot, a lot of the people that listen to this want to learn more. And I encourage them to just meet other people that are, we're, we're speaking the same thing. We have different nuances and different ways to talk about it. But what we're doing is we need to like rise up because Wall Street and some other pundits uh, of the world are, are getting loud. And so we have to figure out a way to um, match that. Totally. You guys can, can find me on any social media, Instagram at Jerry Feta. Um, you add me on Facebook, Jerry Feta. You can follow our Wealth Dynamics page as well. Um, and, and yeah, if you just Google Jerry Feta, a ton will pop up. So that's, <laughs> that's, like, a, that's and, like a power move. Just Google my name and it'll, Google will tell you'll you. You'll see. You'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, man. Uh, the question I end all my podcasts with are the legacy question. And the legacy question goes like this. Um, this is your last day on earth. Your last conversation with the people that you love the most. Um, and knowing what you know now, what would you share with the people that you love the most about all the things that you learned if you had that one last conversation? That's a good question. Um, I'm a very analytical thinker, so I'm thinking about what, what I've already told them up to this point. But if, if, I, <laughs> if I haven't shared all the stuff with them, um, I, th- I think my, my thing would be save 40%. Like if, if nothing else, go do that. You will, that's the linchpin. You do that, everything is fine. I've probably already taken care of them from a legacy standpoint. They may or may not know that at that point in time, but I would want them to do the, the 40% rule. I love it, man. Uh, appreciate you. And, and yeah, I hope you have an amazing rest of your day. And I'm excited to continue to rise the tide with you and, and share this message. Awesome. Thank you so much, Caleb. Thank you so much for listening to the Better Wealth Podcast. It would mean the world to me if you could hit subscribe, leave a review, and share this with the people that you know and love.